Welcome. I need to begin with uh, an announcement that uh, someone has lost a brown jacket with a Brazilian passport in it. And if you have any idea of its whereabouts, please uh, uh, go to the registration desk. Thank you. Welcome to For Planet and People, Expanding Human Activity Via Transgressive Learning and Social Change. It is my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Hela Latsasitka. And it is my hope to do so without embarrassing her, because we know how great her humility and her modesty is. But this is difficult because her accomplishments in environmental education research and her contributions to the field are so important. In Africa, we have a widespread concept originating in a Zulu proverb. Umuntu, gumuntu, gabantu. It's similar to the Ubuntu cultural ideal. It's about humanity and what it means to be human in the African context. A person is a person through other people. We create each other and we need to sustain each other's creation. Of course, this is true of all of us. A person is a person through other people. So allow me to talk about the great influence on African environmental education scholarship of the people at the Environmental Learning Research Center at Rhodes University in Grahamstown, South Africa, where HALA works. The research of this center provides intellectual leadership across sub-Saharan Africa in environmental education. Indeed, Rhodes University is celebrating this year 25 years of the Murray and Roberts Chair of Environmental and Sustainability Education. And the celebrants will include many who work with HALA, from Eureta Rensenberg, who occupied the chair before HALA, to people in the local community of the Eastern Cape province uh, who are influenced by programs in workplace learning. Further, the influence of the center goes across the Republic of South Africa in its work with national curriculum, uh, research projects of all kinds, including with the African, uh, Southern African National Research Plan. Further, the center influences work across the 17 nations of the SADAC region, the Southern African Development Corporation region, through the center's housing of the Environmental Education Association of Southern Africa and the Journal of Southern African Environmental Education and Ethics. Even further, the influence goes across Africa through the very significant contributions of the 23 PhDs that HALA has supervised in doctoral research, who now occupy many influential positions across the continent. So HALA is who she is because of these amazing people and what they are. It is also true that they are who they are because of who she is. She's an environmental educator who creates space for her students to be empowered. She's a theorist with a breathtaking arc of scholarship across critical theory, social theory, educational philosophy, social ecological science, critical realism, ethics, workforce analysis, post-colonial analysis, uh, workplace learning, I should say. So she's also a mentor to many of us in the field across the generations, including myself. She's an intellectual leader who speaks to the urgency of radically reshaping environmental education. And she's a woman herself of transformative agency and transgressive thinking. And so, Ubuntu, you who are because Hela is, please welcome Hela, who is because you are.
Thank you so much, Peter, for, for honoring, actually, the research community that I am very much an integral part of, both in South Africa, in Southern Africa, but also in the international um, arena. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here today, and I want to thank our Swedish colleagues for inviting me back to Gothenburg. I was here in 2003, I think, with the um, learning, learning to Change Our World meeting. Um, and we're back here again today. Um, my talk today, I've titled it um, For Planets and People, Expanding Human Activity Via Transgressive Learning and Social Change. And I'll start just with a little contextual background uh, introduction, and then I'll just move on to some of the research that uh, we've been doing in our research community, try to share that a little bit with you, and then perhaps look at some pointers for how we might take this kind of research forward as we go um, um, into the rest of this century, <laughs> since we've already like, started it off now, 15 years into the, the first part of it. So, one of the research questions that I have been working on, uh, I guess since I started environmental education research in 1992, is this question, because uh, at that time, Eureka um, Rosenberg and my uh, supervisor, Professor, the late Professor Donny Schroeder, were having discussions about this, and my colleague, uh, Robert Donny, with Arian and others, Environmental education is a process of social change. And that question has fascinated me ever since. And I thought it was an easy question to answer, but in fact, it's an incredibly difficult question to answer. And you could say, yes, of course, it is, okay? Because that's what we all aspire to in our environmental education practices. Otherwise, we would probably not be doing environmental education because we are all trying to respond to something which is known as the environmental crisis, ongoing environmental degradation, and its re associated relationship to social injustices, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we've seen this just, you know, expanding over the last 20 whatever years since I've been doing this work. But the question that has fascinated me is, yes, of course, if we say this, how might this be so? So how might environmental education be a process of social change? And this is a difficult question because I come from a history, a country with a history which uh, had a social change project which was really social engineering of the most extreme form and in the name of uh, apartheid. Uh, many of you will know it. It's a, an extension of you know, fascism and also many forms of colonialism and so on. So it's not easy to answer this question because one cannot just uh, assume uh, what that relationship is because you can so easily slip into social engineering. And this, to my mind, has been the central issue that I've really been struggling with for all these years. So we um, are facing, I guess, a very complex uh, time I've mentioned that the concerns that we are working around seem to not be getting uh, any less. They seem to be getting uh, pro perhaps more pronounced. Um, this is a, just a picture really of the world and also our region, the Southern African region, at risk. We use the language of risk a lot in environmental education. And in such a context, when we're looking at you know, up, uh, moving towards uh, where we are, between six to eight degrees of warming, if we do not mitigate as is expected, um, then we are facing very, very serious humanitarian crisis. Some say it's a humanitarian crisis that will be worse than the long history of slavery and colonialism. So these are serious issues, and the question that we can ask ourselves in such a context, uh, how should we think about learning? I worked on a paper with my colleague David Cronlitt recently, and we talked about learning should really be a capability for enabling us to navigate this kind of a context and risk. So we see this discourse, the world at risk. We also have our scientist, Ariane mentioned the other day, talking about the Anthropocene. And when we look into the scientific literature, it talks about the Anthropocene and this world at risk driving many types of changes at lower scales in linked social ecological systems, we hear that, 
And what I've added in there is, and also in a range of human activity systems, because if we don't concentrate on the human activity systems in these social ecological systems, we might actually be focusing in, in the wrong direction altogether. And then the scientists are saying, and if you can, these changes are being driven, they can feed back up to the global level and they may interact with baseline geological change. So this change process that we're looking at is quite complex. It's multi-leveled. I think Ariane presented some of that the other day as well. So the question again for me around this idea of how is how does this uh, translation occur and what is the role for learning? And learning, if we're in the field of education, is really central to, to what we are all about. Um, so what I wanted to do was really just share with you and offer you some perspectives from our research program, the one that Peter introduced. It's a 25-year-old this year, so we're having some, some, some good times doing reflection and looking into the future. But our research program is in the southern part of, of Africa there, and we have an incredible research community of scholars that come from pretty much all over the continent. And these are some of I think some of the most creative um, scholars on the continent and who are really interested in this issue of transformation, transformative human agency, transforming our practices and looking at uh, learning and the role of learning. So uh, at the core of this research program, we are focusing on this question of environmental learning, human agency and social change. And again, it's not an easy relationship. Uh, to uh, fully understand and explain. And then once we get a better understanding of that, we're trying to look into what the implications are for education, curriculum, pedagogy, uh, social learning in various contexts like schools, workplaces, and communities. So uh, learning and agency, and this we've seen from all of our students' work, all of our our own work, work across the continent, is that learning and agency, because all human beings do have agency, we're all able to act, we're all able to think and act, unless, of course, we are uh, um, uh, se severely uh, brain damaged, uh, because we do have these capabilities to learn and to act. And this we do in so many different contexts. And just in the middle there are just a few of the the range of different types of contexts in which we do our learning and our actions, and they spread across this massive, um, very beautiful continent. And so what we've decided to do in our research program is to try to look at this question of human activity and this, the human activities that people are involved in in these different contexts, different countries, different places, and let's see what we can learn about uh, this question. Now, the thing about these activities that are taking place around this continent and actually all over the world, you'll find them in your, own, in your own region, in your own countries, in your own towns, in your own homes, actually, is that these activities take place within what one could call a complex nexus of concerns. They're not straightforward. Activities are quite interesting things when you start to look at them. And here's one example of an activity of... of uh, um, a group of women that are trying to produce uh, charcoal, fuel wood for uh, cooking. And the cycle of activity there you can see is, you know, the chopping of the trees, the carrying of the wood, you can see it's not an easy activity, it's a tough, hard work activity. The production of the bags of charcoal and the selling of the charcoal, and then we end up with, you know, a, a landscape which is devoid of trees, and then we have to start having activities, afforestation activities, to try to resolve these kinds of issues. Um, so these are complex issues, and this one you can see is a nexus of poverty, deforestation, energy issues, gender issues, and if I could say it, I think also very weird economic issues. I mean, you can imagine that amount of work for a bag of charcoal, which approximately two to five euros, is, and how our society has uh, established itself to condone this kind of an economic system is uh, quite often beyond, m m beyond me. <laughs> so these are the complexities of these activities. So in these activities, as I said, people are learning. People learn to do these activities. They don't just wake up one morning and suddenly know how to do these activities. They learn them from other people. 
um, and they exercise agency as they do these activities. So we need uh, uh, new kinds of activities, new kinds of learning, new kinds of agency, um, so that we can break some of these unsustainable cycles of, and practices and ongoing marginalizations and these things that, you know, Roy Bascar will call ills. He says, the, the, you know, he talks about the ills in our society. So, and when we do this, there's much more to these activities than just knowledge. So it's not possible to just transfer knowledge uh, in order to develop these activities. We actually have to look at this knowledge action gap and how to work on that gap. And Harold Glaser wrote a very brilliant paper in um, Arian's book in 2007, where he actually troubled this gap and he was asking, well, what happens in this gap? Why is the gap there and what happens in the gap? And this is what uh, I think we need to work on. And so we've been working on this learning activity focus in trying to understand that. And so from this work, we are you know, beginning to say that uh, agency for change and transformation needs to involve multi-leveled, connected activity systems. So activities in a range of different places, you can't focus also on one little activity in one place because it's networked and connected to other activities. Um, so f uh, and so we need to look at these interconnected activity systems and within these try to look at this uh, transgressive, transformative, expansive, you know, type of learning which is going to build new kinds of activities. Um, and uh, recently I've been doing more reading in, in of some of the decolonial literature and I'm finding it to be quite helpful in thinking about this notion of transgressive learning. And here's a little uh, piece from Lewis Gordon, uh, who doesn't write about environmental education at all, but he writes about uh, the complex issues that are facing uh, people in, mainly in the global south. So he says, in reflecting on the need for transformative learning from a decolonizing perspective, Lewis Gordon suggests that a form of leadership and learning is needed that involves serious and substantive meditation on and cultivation of maturity of how to negotiate, how to live, and how to transform a world of contradictions, paradoxes, uncertainty, and unfairness. So he kind of like summarizes, I think, some of it, it quite nicely, the kind of task that we have when we're looking at uh, learning and agency for social change. So now I just want to share with you a little bit of some of the emerging research that is coming out of our research center. Um, Peter mentioned that we've had quite a number of PhDs that have graduated from that center. We currently have a big group of PhDs, very creative, uh, very active, good researchers. And we also have uh, quite a number of master scholars. So what I'm going to share with you here is some of the fruits of, of their work. So we got interested in this question, learning, agency, and social change, and we decided to kind of try and explore it a little bit more. And we had to start somewhere. So we started uh, with some help from uh, um, Alan Reed and Jutta Nickel and the, our Danish colleagues. We went to a seminar where they were talking about participation in education. And Alan produced this you know, very nice sort of summary of different uh, traditions of learning theory that have emerged over the last however many hundred years. And so we started to look at these traditions, look into the literature, try to understand the meaning of these traditions, and uh, we ended up deciding that we were very interested in these kinds of communities of practice type of ideas, activity system research, participatory, uh, community-orientated research approaches. So that's what we started with um, a few years ago. And then we started with what we call a research program with quite a number of, of scholars who were interested in being part of this. And they started to, uh, we started to explore, first of all, the idea of change-orientated learning. So how can learning be change-orientated? And how is that related to sustainability practices? Here's one of my colleagues, Dick Kachalonda. Some of you will know him. He was uh, um, heading up the African RCE network and also involved in the SADC REAP and very, very committed to the fisheries in, in and around Lake Malawi, where they're trying to implement co-management activities. Fishers and the government officials and the college lecturers and the researchers are all trying to implement these co-management activities. So he took up you know, his research in that context. And um, 
we uh, had various other scholars who, who decided, and they decided to work on activities, particularly in areas where transformation was really quite, you know, really quite important for uh, human well-being and better livelihoods and so on of, of local people. So we worked with women, women farmers, fishers, community foresters, beekeepers, local government officials, teachers, and we've worked with many people across the SADC region to try to look at this. We've also been moving with this research project, I think, to become, if I could call it, a bit more stronger in our voice in terms of how we talk about transformative learning, and I'll share a bit of that with you. And we've been looking at new inspiration for this work, so we've been looking at, you know, uh, the, the, the idea that environmental issues are also social justice issues, both for current and future generations. Um, and so if we start there, we can start to look at some of the, the sort of more uh, critical literature, looking at people's collective activities and how those work, social movements, uh, reconstructive social theory is, is a new and emerging area that's quite interesting, transgressive learning theories, uh, post frarian African liberation pedagogy, we've been looking into that, and then also post-colonial and decolonization theory, to try to get you know, ways of seeing and thinking about the problem that we have. And one of my PhD students has given this title, to, given this phrase, put it into her PhD title, she said, not yet Uhuru, which really means not yet freedom. We haven't been able to achieve freedom despite the fact that we have independent states. We have new challenges which are uh, requiring us to think about freedom and solidarity in new and different ways. So, um, what we have emerging is uh, this community of Southern African researchers that are um, producing insights into this expansive learning activity development and agency, and I'll just name a few of them just to give you some sense of the kinds of contributions that they're beginning to make to this body of work. So Mutizwa, who comes from um, Zimbabwe, he, uh, in his PhD project, he ended up saying, you know, one of the most critical issues is we have to look at the issue of cognitive justice when we're looking at transformative learning and agency and so on. And we have to hear what people have to say and we have to hear what people think. We can't only come with what we think. So this idea of cognitive justice being very important. Here's Dick Kachalonda's thesis and that showed up the very important part of looking at uh, traditional power relations and how to, you know, uh, challenge those. Lizanne Olvert has done a very nice study where she looked at uh, the uh, reflexive deliberations and people's ultimate concerns, what people actually care about at the end of the day and how, that Im how important that is for transformative learning. And there's many others. Here's another one uh, which looked at uh, beekeepers and he came up with looking at how important it was for people to be able to frame and reframe how they think, in other words, to shift the foundations of their thinking in and through these learning processes. This is a study coming out quite soon out of Mozambique. It's a really interesting study looking at community uh, irrigation schemes. And he has come up with the idea of you have to look very carefully at the absences, in other words, what is not there. And then you have to think about how that can become possibility, otherwise you can't see transformation or possibilities for transformation. Um, Titch, another one of uh, our PhDs, and he's working with the idea of crossing boundaries and how to think about hope as we do our work. Um, another one looking at implicit mediation, not everything that is said is what uh, is involved in a learning process. There's a lot of implis implicit things that, c that have, a, have a role to play, and so on. And there are many, many others of these kinds of insights, and we hope maybe in the next few years we'll be able to produce these into some kind of a book to share with, with you. And what's been interesting to me is to see that there's actually quite a big interest in this research, and some of our big environmental um, and social change projects that are working at like catchment scales is a huge USAID project working across transboundary rivers and they are very interested in this kind of research because of course everybody is trying to understand how we should you know transform human activity so that we can become more sustainable. So here's just some pictures from some of the research contexts. You can see Lake Malawi, the farmers in the fields along the coasts and so on. 
Here's some of the expansive learning workshops that the scholars have been running with people all around the region. Um, and these are very fascinating two, three day programs and then they go back again and they go back again and just work with people to conceptualize and think about alternative and new human activity. What does it mean on the shores of Lake Malawi? What does it mean uh, on a sustainable agricultural uh, project and so on and so on. So we're getting some quite interesting insights coming out of this work, which I'll just share a few of them with you. One is that we have to give much more attention to learning processes and relationships in learning. And uh, one of the things that comes up time and time and time again is that our societies lack learning forums. We have meetings and we have structures and we have uh, constitutions and we have all kinds of things, but we don't have learning forums. <laughs> Isn't that just such an interesting issue? And it comes up almost in every single one of these, these studies. This issue of cognitive justice and language is also incredibly important if you are looking at transformative learning. We have to unlearn and relearn, and this is very difficult often. Um, and then we also have to be willing to cross borders and boundaries. Uh, and these are some of the insights on this one. We're also getting um, some very interesting insights into what we're calling the sort of the, the unseating of powers <laughs> and structures and why this is important so that we can unleash new cultural activity, new types of, of thinking and so on. And here, there's various things that are also, you know, becoming interesting and important. One of which is that we have to understand these underlying structures that hold things in place uh, in order to really begin to transform things at a, a more, uh, more complex level. We have to understand power relations, and we found the idea of power one, which is the power of the agent, the person. I have power one. Power two, the opp oppressive structures around me. We found that quite a useful idea to begin to think about power relations. We've been working more with post-colonial thinking, and then this concept of absence is becoming quite an exciting concept in our research community now. And Bascar says, absence is the great loosener. <laughs> it kind of loosens up, and you can then begin to move forward if you can identify these absences. We're also learning uh, about research and research approaches, particularly generative research approaches. Um, and how they can open up change processes. So the way in which you do your research can be extremely significant for transformative learning and agency. And we're getting quite a few interesting insights here, particularly around things like who sets the questions, how you work with your data, uh, uh, prioritization and negotiation as really important parts of the research process rather than, for example, just collecting data, you know, so it changes the way and the role of the researcher. We're also getting interesting insights into the change processes themselves. The most important one is that change is not linear, okay? These are not linear processes, and they take time, and they also, you can see here in this one analysis, implementation and resistance, implementation and resistance, implementation and resistance, implementation and resistance. So they require you to be stubborn <laughs> and to continually keep looking at this issue of implementation and resistance, what is happening when you get resistance and to try to understand that. So these are some of the things that we're finding there. The other interesting part of this research is we're also starting to find ways of tracking uh, transformative agency. So we're beginning to be able to see these features of transformative agency. Um, and that you can find often in people's uh, abilities and capacities to actually change activity. And if you start to look at how that occurs, you can begin to see some very, very interesting things, particularly around, we often think that agency is an individual thing. I act, but actually, no, we never do. We act, or we act with the blessing of others, or with the solidarity of others. And it's very, very interesting that in these um, analyses that our students are doing is that you'll only ever find somebody willing to do something if they know they have support. So solidarity and individual agency is a very interesting relationship uh, in terms of transformation. 
that I think we can also understand better. And then we're seeing actually real changed practices. This is an example of a, of a rainwater harvesting pond that was built by college lecturers, uh, farmers, researchers, <laughs> community members, who just got like, involved in this learning process and decided to build these ponds because they needed water for their food. And uh, many other examples of these actual changed activities and practices. So this work has been very interesting, but we have a lot of debates in our research community. One of them is, when can we say that this expansive learning is socially transformative? And this, again, is not an easy question, okay? Because what's transformative to you might not be the same as what's transformative to me, or it can be transformative, but at a very superficial level. Um, and if you really want to solve the problem of the, you know, two to five euros for a bag of that charcoal, you know, what is transformative in that context, actually? And then how do you begin to get closer to uh, transformative uh, agency and practice. So this is a big debate, and we're discussing the words that we use to describe this problem. And so our research, we've talked about change-orientated learning, we've talked about expansive learning, we've talked about transformative learning, and the one that we like getting excited about at the moment is transgressive learning, because it seems to have a little bit more of a sort of uh, punch, if I could call it that, and when we start to look into it, it is actually about normative being, you know, explicitly normative in the way in which you think about transformation. It's dialectical. It also involves this sort of like double transgression of identifying the absence, what's not there, and then a process of emergence, bringing that into being if it wasn't there before. So it's, it's, there's some interesting dimensions to that. And then we've also been looking into some of the, you know, some of the strong and long, if I could call it that, learning theory work. Particularly some of the earlier work of uh, Vygotsky has become very interesting to us. And Anna Statensko, who writes out of the, the Vygotskyan work, she says that actually we should always adopt an activist transformative stance in the way that we think about learning because people come to be human in and through and not in addition to the processes of collaboratively, collaboratively transforming the world in view of their goals. So people decide that they would like to do things, they learn how to do that, and they actually do that. And that's a normal human process. But what the transgressive learning does is it says in which direction, you know, and in whose benefit. Public good, selfish, what, what, what? You know, these are the questions that one can begin to ask. So just coming, to, coming to, towards the end, perhaps, of my talk, I have five what I call final thoughts on how we can take this kind of work forward in our field, both from a research and a practice point of view. And I think the first point is that I think we do need to have a much stronger recognition um, that responding to the risks and the challenges of the Anthropocene involves this relationship. The relationship between learning, human agency, what we can do, what we're learning in order to do something, and how that relates to social change. So understanding this relationship from where I stand, I think, is, is really an important one. And the difficulty about that is that <laughs> it's that sort of a relationship. It's one that's quite squiggly and wiggly and many different dynamics to it and dimensions to it. So we shouldn't try to be linear or technicist about this, but we have to let it emerge in these sort of open system approaches where we work with people to think about what it is that is possible in the context where they are in terms of what they uh, would be able to think about in terms of, of changes. So that's the one thing. The second thing is I think that we still need to develop some more useful, perhaps, ways of thinking about multi-leveled and emergent uh, transform transformations, and I've been very excited to talk to the Swedish colleagues here this week. They're talking about scaling and upscaling and looking at models of thinking about how we can capture this sort of movement of our work uh, into wider and bigger systems of transformation. So we can see changes in thinking very easily 
in education, and our whole education system is set up to assess those. That's not difficult at all. Every single assessment task is often orientated to those. Uh, we can also see changes in tactics, in other words, how people act, yeah? in terms of their social practices, the more sort of established things that they do. We can also see uh, transformations and changes in more egalitarian and uh, just policies, for example, and in our country we've seen you know, the importance of those kinds of policies in terms of, of transforming society. Also new institutional forms, so if we get sort of interdisciplinary centers or um, a new sustainability institute or whatever, we can see transformations there. Um, I think we can also begin to see transformations if we look at social movements, in other words, where people are collaborating and working together. Um, new public spheres, in other words, new ways in which people can, can be, be democratic in their, in their societies. And then the most difficult one is these transformed structures and mechanisms for shaping new human activity. And the most difficult one of those is the economic structure. It's being discussed a lot around the world, but I don't think that we're discussing it properly at all yet. You know, people have read Thomas Piketty's book, and uh, it's a little bit of a shocking read, especially if you're middle class, because you start to realize, oh, all the middle classes are not gonna get as rich as the 1% that own more than uh, something like 54 of the world's countries. We haven't started to discuss that problem properly yet, and it is a very deep, and difficult mechanism to shift. Um, yeah, so we can see these kinds of things, you know, you ban the plastic bag and everybody uses cloth bags the next day. That happened in my country. We can change minds and we can change some of these sort of more deep-seated structural things. And all of this is possible and it all becomes possible uh, not because it just happens, it is possible because of human activity. Somebody, somewhere, is working with other people, somewhere, to do this stuff, you know? They're learning to do it, they don't just wake up and know how to do it. So these are the interesting things. This is the work of education, I think, is to tap into that massively rich uh, arena of human activity um, as we move forward. So the important thing about this way of thinking about learning uh, and agency, and I'm talking about agency from below because I'm talking about people as agents in everyday activity, all of us, right? We're not waiting for the prime minister or the mm, deputy director general or the whoever to do it for us. It's agency from below, it's people, people's agency. So this brings us to think about education a little bit differently, I think. Um, and we have to disrupt and we have to also decolonize our educational thinking. And I'm using the word decolonization purposefully here because all of us have been colonized by a particular way of thinking about education. All of our minds have been colonized by it, whether you're white or black or whether you from Paris or from wherever. We, we all have been, our minds have been colonized by uh, a certain form of educational thinking, which we can actually change because we are people, agents, people can do things. So um, some of the literature here is, is quite interesting and this is a piece from a guy called Nigel Gibson and he is a theorist of Frantz Fanon. I don't know if you know, Fran many of you know Frantz Fanon, but he is one of the leading African uh, post-colonial thinkers. And uh, so he uses this idea, and he's been studying the learning processes in social movements in the Shack Dwellers Association, one of the world's greatest and biggest uh, social movements, very active social movement, with a very strong idea about what they actually want from life and learning. So he says that the idea of developing a new language of struggle runs counter to the academic discourse or formal university or formal education discourse where the emphasis is on learning a field's specialized scholarly 
language. And of course we need to learn the fields of specialized scholarly language because we need those, but we need to do probably more with those than we are able to do or are doing at the moment. Um, yeah, so I think, and we are more and more interested in this, is to try and learn more from the social movements and also to be a little bit braver about naming a new language of learning. And uh, here's again from Franz Fanon, he says, it's from our action and struggle that questions arise. What needs to emerge is a new language of learning that supports social movement and action. And if we are going to be able to uh, respond to that first picture that I showed you of the warming, the warming world that we are in, we are going to need to do this work uh, more, I think. Um, and then lastly, I think the important thing is also is to think very carefully and critically about um, the meaning of new human activity. Uh, it's a kind of something that doesn't always exist as yet. It's c coming up for us. It's something that might be possible. So it's a little bit into the unknown. And this is just such an amazing example. One of my PhDs sent it to me yesterday. Um, and it's, it's from his study where he's been working with farmers. And uh, they've had a big program. And the big training program has been um, mobilizing all of these farmers to uh, take up beekeeping as a climate change adaptation strategy. But the problem is, so it could be a very good new human activity, but you can see the beehives over there. And the, the problem is that the bees are no longer there. <laughs> so this kind of uh, recommendation for you know, new human activity in that context is, is futile. Okay, the, the bees have gone. So, and why I'm just using this example, because the bees are gone, not because the bees would just want to go, okay? The bees have gone because of the, the changes in the, 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 the um, environmental conditions. So, we have changing environmental conditions, we have re uh, recommendations for new human activity, but have we aligned our thinking about the new human activity with this changing environmental conditions. And this is, is the challenge, I think, as we go forward. So I just wanted to end there with that little example um, and to say thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hela. And we do have time for questions. Hela's agreed Good. to take questions. We have runners with mics, great volunteers. Is there a question for Hela? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Hela, for this brilliant presentation. I was intrigued uh, when you spoke about power one and power two which was a new way you know, of conceptualizing power, which I haven't heard of. So could you please you know, develop that a little bit further? Thank you. Yeah. Should I just take one question at a time? Up to you. Would you like it? Here's another one in the front. I'll take yeah. two and then maybe, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's uh, actually captivating. Uh, the issue of comfort zone, it's been found everywhere in every society in terms of maybe if you want to change, uh, sh maybe shift in thinking or you want to change people's behaviors towards the environment. So in this case, how do you go about it in terms of maybe shift in social learning through reorientation and a kind of Yes, there is issues of uh, uh, decolonization and recolonization. If uh, somebody could be taught in his own local language, I think is that, that is another issue entirely. Is that okay to say local language 
and culturally acceptable practices and locally relevant issues are going hand in hand with uh, social learning at the same time. Thank you. Okay, got that. Okay, um, thank you for those two questions. Uh, Corin, the power one and power two uh, we came to because we were struggling to find a way of um, working with uh, ideas of power that w could allow also for you to think about the sort of power of the person and the power of uh, the agent. Um, so Bascar, Roy Bascar, it comes from Roy Bascar's work from Critical Realism, and he writes about this power one and power two relationship. And it, it kind of like he says that it's important for us to differentiate the two. If, so the power one being the power of the agent, your capability to think, to reflect, to speak to other people, to learn. We have uh, that as a sort of like, I guess, uh, an intrinsic and also a, cult a cultured type of, of power that we, we do have. And then we know that in our societies there are powers that are oppressive, so those could be structural, the kind of structural powers, uh, governance powers, uh, many others, agenda relations, uh, you, you're very familiar with those kinds of issues. So he says that we should try to, uh, in our work, try to strengthen as much as we can power one relations that, so that they can become more capable of engaging with power two relations. Mm -hmm. So I guess that means you know, giving attention to our possibility as human beings in order to uh, be more critical or be more activist or to be com more committed or more emotional or whatever it's we need in order to uh, engage these things that continue to oppress us. So I think it sort of uh, recovers uh, a little bit of power around agency, but doesn't, uh, it doesn't fall into the trap of voluntarism, which assumes, you know, people can do anything that they want <laughs> just because they're there, which is also not true, you know, we know that. It's, it's not that easy, yeah. So I don't know if that helps. And then the question around uh, whether um, all of this learning is around local, sort of local contextual uh, processes. I think that there's always has to be uh, some form of um, what you call it locally, local engagement in our learning activities because we are situated somewhere. But that doesn't mean that we can't work with concepts and ideas and sophisticated um, uh, technologies or anything from other places. So one of the important things about this work is not to get too stuck in your own local contextual, uh, because you can then end up with what's a sort of local conservatism, or lo you can become localized, too localized, and then only have yourself and your friends for reference. You know, so we need to be able to move in and out of our local activity uh, engagements with other activity systems, and that's why I made the point about interacting activity systems rather than just the one local activity system. So I don't know if that answers the question there. Thank you, Hela. Comments or questions? Looking forward to the party. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hela, hi, I'm Mark hi. Edwards from the University of Western Australia. Hi. Could I ask about this relationship between top-down and bottom-up? Um, and you've talked about bottom-up transformation, but I'm finding that the, the, there's almost this shift of responsibility which suits the agenda of many to retain current structures to shift the responsibility for transformation to the bottom. Could you say something around that with regard to your yeah. approach of this bottom-up bottom mm. transformation? Yeah, um, I don't think it's either or, um, and one of my PhDs recently wrote a paper on bottom up and top down and the kind of uh, kind of engaged space that exists uh, in between. And when you think about the concept of activity systems, they occur at all levels in society. So you can have a policy activity system, 
and you can have you know, a local community activity system and you can have uh, transformed human activity in any of those activity systems. So you can have policy makers that are making transformative policy. An example being, you know, Vali Musa, who was our Minister of Environment, and he banned plastic bags. And that had a huge transformative uh, effect in South African society around just being more aware of environmental concerns, you know, and uh, some practices and so on. So I, I, I don't think it's an either or, but I think we should recognize also that policy making is also a human activity and there are activity systems that operate there. I mean, I've worked a lot with UNESCO. UNESCO is an activity system. It does certain kinds of work. Um, and that's not disconnected from the work that I do in Grahamstown with a group of school children. They are connected. And mm -hmm. it's these connections that I was saying we need to have better ways of tracking them, you know, and looking at them. Yeah. Yes, sorry, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I was curious about your comment about learning forums, and I was just wondering if you could expand on what a learning forum would look like, oh. sound like, feel like, and why did you say that it was there was an absence or gap, and why would it be very important for transgressive learning and social change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is just something that has been coming out of the different studies, and I think it's because what the scholars have been trying to do is to work with uh, different activity systems. So, like, they'll work, say, for example, with the management activity system and the foresters and the community and the environmental managers across these different activity systems. And there seems to be very little way that these, if you can call it different, different types of people get connected in order to be able to learn together. So the learning forums that they refer to are learning forums that allow for this cross-border kind of learning. Uh, that's uh, more specifically. And it seems to me that those seem to be necessary for this kind of transgressive work because you need to be able to get out of your own comfort zone and, and be able to speak and learn with, with people that you're not normally engaged with. So it's in that sense that the issue of the learning forums has come up. I think there are lots of you know, uh, other kinds of learning forums, but this is a specific type. Sorry, I should have been a bit more specific about that. Yeah. Thank you. Question here. Yeah, thank you very much for that. It was really interesting. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering wh uh, whether you picked up or how you address uh, the work of people like George Marshall and Daniel Kahneman, you know, the, the sort of so, psychosocial dimensions. Oh, sorry, I'm not hearing fully. Just yeah, sorry. Yeah, the work of people like George Marshall, you know, climate denialism and whatever, and uh, Daniel Kahneman and that whole area of uh, what permits or, or limits change in terms of psychosocial processes that it's now emerging. As, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think I have to ask Marsha to answer that <laughs> question, actually. Well, it's a whole area of, sort yes, of no, mind it's science huge, and change that is... It, it is. It's yeah. a huge area, and I, I must admit that we haven't looked at it in great detail, but I am aware of, of that, yeah, that kind of thing. And I think don't think that this change is, is simple, you know, and nor is uh, um, uh, human decision-making, you know, as to why we do things. And we all know that things like fear, for example, are very influential in terms of what you may or may not uh, be able to do or want to do or even think uh, is possible. So doing this work is not uh, simple, uh, no. So maybe, I don't know if that answers, but yeah. Thank you. One question, is there a final question or comment? Yes, sir. Okay, Leila, uh, thanks for a brilliant speech. I have a little kind of double question. In, uh, I think you had a very exciting concept with the absence, and I don't mm -hmm. think that it was explored enough mm -hmm. for us all to, to understand what is in it. Okay. But uh, just to, to cheat you a little, I would say, I think also there perhaps was an, a kind of absence in, in the, when you talk about social change, where are technology 
May I add the material and, and what it means to practice and change of mm -hmm. practice? I think I know you in your center, you also work with that, but also mm -hmm. I think you just to encourage you to, mm -hmm. to, to say a few things about that. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think if I had to start talking about absence now, it would take me a long time because mm. we, we're busy exploring uh, the concept of absence um, because it comes across as being also very sort of straightforward while well, something is absent. So you can have an, absent, an absence of a litter bin in a schoolyard. So you have an absence of the socio-material technical object that's going to help you to um, manage the waste on the last picture there that those school children were looking at. Um, so you have an absence there, but uh, there are different kinds of absences. So you can then ask the question, well, why is that uh, litter bin uh, not in the school? Because we know it's possible to have litter bins in the school. We've seen thousands of schools around the world where there are litter bins. So why is there an absence of litter bins in the school when we know you know, we can do better with managing our waste. So then you can ask a question of, well, what, what sits behind that absence? And so you can kind of go into quite a range of different ways of thinking about absence. And the work of Pascal, he says that we should look at, you know, not only the nominal absences, in other ones, the ones that are most easy to observe, but we should really be looking at the, the real absences. So, for example, the absence of... Uh, a, ben a more benign economic system or an absence of the kinds of technology that could help us to do uh, things in different ways. My uh, student who's doing the work on irrigation systems in Mozambique, he says that um, it's possible to do uh, community-based irrigation in you know, A, B, C and D ways because we know that in another context it's being done in A, B, C, and D ways, but there's an absence of that possibility here, where we are trying to do uh, the irrigation system management. So if we want to improve our irrigation system management, can we look to what is present elsewhere? Can we uh, think about what we have to do so that we don't have the problem of not having the technology? You know, so it's that sort of like way of thinking. And the socio-technical question is, is a very big question. Um, I didn't focus on it a lot in this talk, but if you start to look into some of the cases, it's definitely there, particularly around trying to create some of the new practices that people do uh, see and think are possible. You know, often you need the, the technolo technology. Say, for example, simple thing, a rainwater harvesting tank to just be able to harvest some water off your roof in order to put some water on your vegetable garden. But you need the tank, and a tank costs 2,000 rand. So if you can't get the tank, mm -hmm. then you have to, we ended up with buying plastic to make the pond, you know? That, that was the alternative that was possible in that particular context, yeah. Thank you, Hela. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for those questions and comments. And Hela, you're, talk is such a good reminder for us that alongside a culture of critique and analysis uh, in research, we need to create a culture of hope and aspiration. It's a very inspiring speech. Thank you so much. Thanks to the translators. Thanks to the organizers. It's uh, really been uh, such a good conference, this iconic Swedish organization, plus a very uh, thoughtful program. And I've been asked to say just a word about what's next. If you'll forgive my pronunciation, I'm going to say that the Congress dinner is uh, about a 12-minute walk from here at the concert hall. And if you go down the main avenue, um, you go about uh, 10 minutes walk uh, down to and turn right at uh, Naya Aleon. And if you go into the water, you've gone too far. Eh? There's a water feature there. If you go there, come back, go right. And um, your destination is uh, Treagorn, which is the tree garden. How's that? And it's at 6.30. There is a program at 7. If you'd like to be there for the program, arrive by 7, and the uh, Congress dinner will go on through the evening. Please wear your badge. And 
Thank you, Hela. Thank you. We are because you are. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Peter.